Okay, so this is going to be the awkward hour with your hosts, Gnome and Tree, because we've never done this together before. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, this is uh, the library. It's a subsect of Project Transparency that's booktubing and book reviews and co-reading with Gnome, because, you know, everything's better when you do it with a friend. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we actually kind of... Erg word. We we both kind of uh, what would you call this? Because <laughs> it's not speed reading. It's um, we kind of absorbed. We kind of devoured. Yes, devoured. We we consumed. We devoured very quickly. Um, Ransom Riggs, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, and the second in the series, Hollow City. Hold one. Okay. Peregrines. Yes. <laughs> so we're gonna kind of talk about both of them together because yes, and the third book is coming out and there's a movie being made of the first book and all the things. So I'm Tree. I'm Gnome. And this is the library. So Gnome, once upon a time, when gnomes were much smaller, actually had a radio show. So if the announcer voice happens, that's what's going on here. I do not make any apologies for it. If you start doing Mr. Corndog, we're going to have a problem. You said it. <laughs> don't, 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 don't. Okay, so uh, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. It's like, you know, my first impressions of it, you know... I was like, oh my god, this is this is excellent and, and interesting, and, and you know, I, I, I rapidly consumed it, but then, you know, I started thinking about it a little more, and like, okay, nothing inherently wrong with yet another, you know, privileged white male protagonist, but... Nothing wrong? Is it nothing inherently wrong? Nothing inherently wrong? Well, that would... No, nothing inherently wrong, because it's saying that there's something inherently wrong with the person who they are. Well, okay, but... When the entire core of, like, basically all of Western literature is white guys, there's kind of something inherently wrong in another one. Okay. <laughs> which is, which to me sounds like you're saying that should, there should never be any white male protagonists ever again. Not ever again, but can we have, like, a decade of maybe no? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, it's like... You know, it, it was, again, the, yes, yet another privileged white male protagonist, and, you know, kind of roll your eyes at that, and, of and course... let's not forget that he is really privileged because parents have Dosh. Well, his mom has Dosh. Yes. And, you know, then, you know, totally artificial, unnecessary romance, and it's like, I have nothing against romance, but it has to I be... I do. Yes. But it has to be very interesting and well written and, and not coming from nowhere and oh my god, I love you and I'm going to sacrifice everything for you. No. So basically what Gnome's getting at and what I'm actually agreeing with for once, because we don't often agree on things, is that Jacob and um, Emma. Emma's entire thing is really unnecessary and doesn't forward the plot in any way, shape, or form. It's like Jacob didn't need Emma there because Jacob has his grandfather Abe's entire mystery everything to get him every place he needs to go and all the alliances he needs to make. Yes. Honestly, honestly, their their very for their very initial relationship when Emma did not trust Jacob as far as she could throw him. Much more interesting. Um, you know, throughout the first half of the first book, you know, the sort of the 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 prickly. That that worked. That was interesting. Yes. And, and the sort of the grudging respect, I can dig that. But yeah, the 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 Jacob then falling head over heels, like and know. Emma falling falling head over heels, and you know that's probably as much displaced Abe as anything else. Uh probably. Which is creepy. It's more than a little creepy. It's really creepy. Their entire relationship is extraordinarily creepy, and the closest we get to it actually being addressed is in Hollow City when Emma talks 
tries to talk Jacob into returning to his own life pre uh, the loops because they're actually back in the present. Yeah, it was, and that was actually a very, very sensible on Emma's part. And of course, what what really annoyed me most about Jacob's responses is just the sort of that not seeming to really care about the rest of the 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 his friends essentially. It's like I'm only doing this for Emma. Yeah, though he does like think about, you know, how he'll he'll, you know, lose the only friends he, he's ever had and except for uh Rick. Yeah, and yeah, he but And he, they they have a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah. He was an interesting character, but I guess I understand why, you know, he was sort of, you know, pushed aside. I, I have hopes that Rick will come back in the third book somehow. There, it's very unlikely, but I think Rick in the peculiar world would be really interesting. Yeah, th though, in, though honestly enough, I was thinking about Rick yesterday, and it's like, wow, he's very much like, of course, I can't remember the character's name in um, Paper Towns, the, the sort of obnoxious friend with the really crappy car. Was it Isaac? No, it was Ben. Ben. It was Ben. And and then again, I thought, well, Ransom Riggs, I think, is was influenced by John Green, so... Well, they, they went to college together, and they, like, were, been writing buddies for a really long time, so of course there's going to be some sort of cross-pollination there. Right. But I think it's also, you know, we all have that annoying friend, or are the annoying friend, <laughs> that everybody just kind of tolerates. I suppose. So basically, like, Enoch. <laughs> Enoch is an entirely different issue, though, you know, I love his name, but they, Enoch is like two steps away from being the, 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 the whites and the, the hollow gas pre-blowy up most of Siberia thing. Yeah, he, he it's probably lucky he was a kid. Yeah, it's very white supremacist and... Enoch talks, and it's not far from it. No. And I think the, the reanimation stuff doesn't help either. Dr. Mangala? Yeah. Kyvern. Kyvern! Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Enoch is creepy, and I don't want him to be a bad guy, because I actually kind of like that he's creepy and a million percent done with the universe, but he's going to be a bad guy. I actually keep waiting, because I have questions and issues with how the logic of the loops works, I actually am waiting for Enoch to somehow manage to end up back in time and be part of the experiment. Kind of like I'm waiting for, for Jacob to actually end up being Abe. I wouldn't be surprised, but I will leave, I will leave the, the, that, you know, advanced level of plot holding to tree. Okay, I think I just, like, <laughs> did most of it, but all right. It, it's, okay. Advanced level plot holding of the time loops has to do with the way that the, it's like, yes, they exist in a outside dimension and pop in and out and time on the outside of it continues going ad nauseum, but they can step out of it and re-enter the timeline. Okay, that makes sense. And if they step out, you know, into the future from where they were born, time catches up with them. That makes sense. But if they step out into their own time, Theoretically, time won't catch up with them because they're still in their own time. Correct? Correct. Okay. <laughs> so, when the loop collapses in Ms. Peregrine's home for peculiar children, and they step out into, the, into 1940, and to September 4th, 1940, theoretically, Abe should still be there waiting for them. Not waiting, but he shouldn't have gone off to the mainland yet. He should still be there. They should have caught up with Abe. And it's like everything that happens in Hollow City didn't happen in the original timeline as far as we can tell because Jacob would have known about it. So time's already changed. Time isn't written in stone as Enoch keeps insisting. Right, and it, yeah, which, and I suppose that would explain the absence of Abe and the idea that, well, Jacob ends up being Abe or something like that. I, I don't know. This is why, you know, authors need to be very careful when they muck around with time travel. Yeah, because this is getting towards paradox. Yeah. 
and not in the not in the actual we we think about it paradox, but in the we really didn't think about it paradox. Yeah. And there's no you know federation uh, you know uh, temporal police to yeah. come fix it. But it would also explain part of the reason why Abe never went back to the loop. If Abe wasn't Abe, if Abe was actually Jacob and knew that Jacob had to actually go to the loop in the future to get back to be Abe. Right, and certainly, and certainly, uh, Jacob's newly newly discovered from pretty much nowhere hollow whispering, um, yeah, uh, ability seems to you know make align with Abe's uh, monster hunting, yes, thing. Though it does also bring up an idea that potentially, somehow, some way, because we have this um, say the name again for me, Enoch German scientist thing. I said Dr. Mengele, you said Kiefer? Oh, Kyburn. Kyburn. Though we have this moment in Hollow City where in uh, where Jacob is, you know, mind melding with a hollow gas, which considering the experiments we learned that happen in Hollow City about how the hollow gas can now pass into loops like whites and peculiars, it there might be an argument to be made that Abe got turned into a hollow gas, and that's who Jacob ran into, and that's why Jacob has to become Abe. Maybe. <laughs> I think about this way too much. Oh, and I guess we probably should have said that. Yes, major spoilers. Yeah. So don't watch. So don't watch this if you're if you're extremely anti-spoiler. Okay. Or watch it anyway. Well, I'll move this to the beginning or something. I don't okay. know. Or I'll just you know. Put a sign that says major spoilers <laughs> That's <probably> ahead. <sighs> Sorry about that. We 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 are we are spoiler people. Spoilers actually prepare us for the emotional trauma that is invariably coming towards us and things. And you know it's a lit crit thing. It is a lit crit thing. Our entire life is one giant spoiler. Pretty much. But then again, the, again, these books have been out for like four years now. I don't think Hollow City's been out that long. Okay, time. well. They've been out for a while. Yeah. But it's not like, you know, the Hobbit level of, you know, yes, we're spoiling you for a book that came out 60 years ago, uh, 2014. Okay. So. So, yes. Um, anything else? Things we want to talk about? Things we like? Well, things definitely like are, are as, as very much usual, it's the supporting cast that, for me, really drives this novel, especially... Especially Bronwyn and and sort of how she's you know smart and you know she she protects people and you know she she doesn't take any crap. Yes, uh, I I really like Win, especially since from all of Abe's stories to Jacob, Win isn't necessarily smart except she's incredibly smart. She she had enough sense to go rip. Uh, armored door off of a tank or off of a submarine to go after a white who was shooting at them. It's like her, between her and Olive, they're the brain trust in this group. Pretty much. <laughs> and you know, Olive too. With you know, she's irrepressible and you know, make makes her, makes that one you know normal friend for in in like two minutes, and then of course they're parted, which is sad. Very sad. And again, I think a lot of times what happens in in really any text is it's the it's those those little moments that sort of really make the text for me rather than the the, the greater plot arc which is again sort of the tip well yeah tip you know you know our species should be ruling the world or we're going to destroy the world ploy it's just kind of boring yeah okay that was rude but I, it's just it, it it's Nazi Germany all over again, and it's white supremacism. It's like, yes, your point has been made many times by many different people, and maybe find a better metaphor. Haha, ha, white supremacism. <laughs> oh my god, I'm sorry, I didn't know I made that joke. Well, Miss, Mr. White the White. Yeah, yeah Mr. White the White. <laughs> um, I do like Horace. I, I, I like that Horace finds courage in weird ways. Yes. Uh, and I'm still pissed about the ice bender. Ah, yes, the ice bender. And, you know, can we, you know, mention in a bypass, in passing the entire really 
stereotypical and kind of awful treatment of the Roma by the text. Yeah, it was like as soon as I got to that, it was just like, okay, yes. Yes, it's the 1940s, but still. And, and yes, they're, you know, the Roma groups lived itinerant lives and, you know, certainly distrusted outsiders for very good, good reason. For very good reason. But, you know, and, and, and of course, you know, having, having them, you know, the re a relationship with, as they called them, the Sindragasti uh, and having, and the, the leader's son being, you know, being invisible. Well, the Sindragasti is uh, the peculiar name for themselves. It's the old language. The old language. Okay. It's just the, the um, Roma leader had learned the term okay. because they have a long-standing treaty. And that was interesting. I... Yes, that was interesting. That would be a really good story. How did the Roma and the Sindergasti form an alliance? Right. So, but you know, that's. I guess that's for. I guess that's for AUs and. Yeah, and thick. Yeah. And I, I really like Hugh and Fiona. I think that they're very, very cute. They're actually a relationship I can get behind. Yes. Mostly because you know bees and flowers. I like the joke. I like the symmetry. Yes. Uh, I was sad that, that, you know, Fiona and Claire were sidelined. Yeah, because Fiona is way more interesting than Emma. I mean, Emma's, like, potentially more, like, offensive usefulness, but she just gets really annoying. Well, you know, main character fatigue. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Jacob and Emma are main character fatigue. So basically, I think what we're saying is, you know, these these are these are you know interesting texts with a lot of you know poten you know potentially useful discussion, and, and it's like we're not saying no, these are awful. No, they're, they're they're fun. They're good. They have potential, and you know that's part of the thing. It's like these are Ransom Riggs's first novels, so you know it's like reading John Green's first novels. Your brain kind of hurts a little bit because they haven't developed as a writer. And I, I think that, you know, the universe that Riggs has created certainly has so much, so much uh, space in it, especially, especially since, you know, the whole thing is concentrated in, you know, Europe. And they, they you know, they mention loops all over the world and thinking, wow, let's, you know, let's investigate, you know, Chinese history loops or, you know, loops somewhere else besides Western Europe. Yeah, can we have, some more representation of other cultures and peoples because they're all very white. Yes, yeah, so that's the other major issue. Is yeah, they're all very fair white. So. All right, so that is our first attempt at booktubing. Yay! Yay! <laughs> do we need to do a, you know, a, a, a like, reblog, subscribe sort of thing? Like, reblog, subscribe? <laughs> We have, uh, well, I have, but no benefits from Patreon support. There's a Patreon link in the, the, the drawer and probably in the end screen, assuming the annotations will work this week. And, yeah. All right. We hope you enjoyed this first edition of the library. Okay. <laughs>